Hi, this is Teddy, and you're listening to Sarah Bitter in Ohio on Two Rods Talking Politics, part of the Deadcast Podcast Network. everyone, this is Kelly Pollock with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast family of podcasts, and I am on today with Sarah Bitter, who is running for the Ohio State Legislature in House District 27. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, thank you for joining me. Uh, so just to start, tell me a little bit about your, your background and why you are running for the State House. Sure. I am a, a mom. Um, I have two kids uh, that are living with a developmental disability. I'm also an attorney and I'm a disability rights advocate. And what got me in this race is that I wanted to create a caucus in our legislature in Columbus so that I could talk about and bring new voices to talk about disability, mental health, and addiction in Ohio. And I have, through the years, uh, my children, my first son was born with a disability, and it took us years to find out um, what his disability was and how to help him. Um, and my second child later was born with the same type of disability. And through that experience, um, I had to learn how to navigate different types of systems. Um, I had to learn how to navigate healthcare systems, um, going to different types of doctors and therapists. And then also trying to figure out how to pay for those things through our insurance. Um, we had a lot of challenges with just trying to figure out what was covered and what wasn't covered. And sometimes there are school systems that would help with some of the therapies and, and some that wouldn't. Um, I felt like I had to learn how to navigate um, education systems, just getting into early intervention preschool, and then all the way through the years um, with my kids' education. And actually, they're both still in school right now. So just learning um, how to work on my kids' IEPs, advocate for them in school. So I feel like I've navigated that system. And then now as they get older, I'm beginning to learn and not just learn, but advocate for them to be able to enter into their adult life. So thinking of things like um, how, how and if they'll be able to get employed someday, jobs, um, transportation, how will they get to and from work, and just um, housing, like where will they live, Um, how will they live, how will they be supported. And so those things really drove me into wanting to run for office, and I tell voters when I meet them that I got in this race because I would like to create a disability, mental health, and addiction caucus in our legislature in Columbus. That's excellent. So tell me then a little bit about the 27th district. This is one of the districts that Swing Left has targeted um, that they think is flippable. Uh, so I, I have a sort of fair idea of where in Ohio it is, but a lot of listeners might not. So if you could sort of tell us, you know, what, what this district looks like. Sure. The district is uh, is in the suburbs of the Cincinnati um, area. So it is it is a district that is pretty, I would say, moderate. I would say that the voters in this district um, often move to this area for the schools. Um, we have several excellent school districts in our district. It's also located close to the city of Cincinnati where people uh, might work. It also has parts of the city of Cincinnati in um, the district as well. So it's a very diverse, I would say, diverse group of um, very educated people who want to have, you know, good schools and who are commuting into oftentimes into Cincinnati for work. The district was considered, it is in Hamilton County, um, and Hamilton County has turned blue, um, I'll say, over the years, but the areas where there are still Republicans in office are more in the suburb areas like where I am running and where I live. So that, that's sort of the makeup of that, of my district. 
And it doesn't seem like anyone thinks the Democrats could totally flip the state legislature in Ohio this year. There just aren't enough competitive districts. Um, but it's certainly possible uh, to break up the Republican supermajority. What would that mean to to be able to break up that supermajority? Yeah, well, first, it is absolutely an, an area that we can win. I actually ran for the state um, Senate seat in 2018. So this is my second run. Um, I lost that lost that race, but this district 27 house seat, our uh, house district 27 is the district that I wanted to, to run the first time. And it also is the area where I did the best. Years ago, like just not even that many years ago in 2014, this district was won by the um, incumbent by almost 35%. And then in 2016, it went down to something around 27%. So they were winning it heavily. Well, in 2018, um, we got it down to a little bit less than 7%. So this is definitely within the range. And what we're finding is that there are um, a lot of unaffiliated, unaffiliated voters in this district, and they went heavily for Democrats last time and for me as well. I think that one of the reasons that I can win this seat is because I'm talking about issues that people really care about, that voters care about. Um, they're nonpartisan issues, issues related to disability, mental health, addiction. These are really important issues. People um, may not realize this, but disability is the largest minority in the world. Um, people with disabilities come from all races, all religions, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all ethnicities. And um, it doesn't matter what party you are. If somebody has a disability, you know, it, it's across the board. And disability is also a really big word. So disability could be somebody who has mental illness, like depression or anxiety or some other type of mental illness. But it also could be a person who has a developmental disability, like autism or Down syndrome. Um, disability can also be a veteran coming back from war who maybe has post-traumatic stress disorder or a police officer who could get post-traumatic stress disorder in the line of duty. So it is a big word and it impacts people on, on a very personal level. And so these are the issues that I talk about. These are issues that I work in, in my profession and my work, but it's also what I, you know, live daily and with my own family members. So I believe that um, in addition to this district changing demographically and, and, and shifting blue, um, that these issues um, really resonate and connect with voters. And so that's my hope is to continue to connect with voters, especially those unaffiliated voters, which make up a very uh, almost 50 percent of the electorate in 27 are actually unaffiliated voters. So that's a really big number. Um, so I'm hoping that a lot of hard work, which I plan to do, and a lot of good organizing that we are going to flip this and break that supermajority in Ohio. And that's, I believe, why this seat was targeted. So in 2018, when we talked to candidates in the, that general area in southwestern Ohio, there was a lot of talk about opioids and how hard hit the area had been with the opioid epidemic. Is that something that that is still the case in that area? Is that something that the voters are talking to you as you are going around and, and uh, meeting them? Yes, they are. Um, when I go and knock on someone's door and I talk to them, um, I bring up, I say the words, I say three words. I, I in, in some way, shape or form, I say the word disability, mental health or addiction. And very often addiction is the one that, um, that they speak with me about. Um, and it absolutely is a major issue. Um, many children have been born to mothers who um, were addicted to opioids. And so we have lots of children in our schools, um, in their foster system. Um, people are, um, you know, family members who are caring, grandparents who maybe are caring for their grandchildren um, or just, you know, every area of our society is in some way impacted by the opioid crisis. Even if they might not know the actual person who has the addiction, um, many people are, that is their loved one, right? Um, so the the issue is still here, hasn't gone away, and now we are, and this is another reason why I would like to be in the legislature to fight for families and for people who are impacted by this, because it's almost become a new type of developmental disability, right? A child who 
who has been exposed to these types of drugs when their mother was pregnant with them. So yes, it's absolutely still a big issue. And people talk to me all the time. I've, I've had people when I knock on their doors, tell me about their loved one, their child, um, a relative dying by suicide, even who are impacted by these, by these drugs. So absolutely. So I, I know another thing that we hear a lot about in Ohio is uh, is employment and workforce. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of talk about how Trump made a lot of promises about, you know, jobs coming back or, or being saved, uh, which which clearly isn't happening. What does that look like in your area of Ohio? Uh, are there concerns about uh, people getting enough uh, enough employment, sufficient employment or the types of employment that they are able to secure? And, and what would you hope to uh, be doing about that in the legislature? Well, the area where I live in, the district that I live in, the big areas that I that I learn um, are on top of people's minds are how small businesses um, are impacted and how they're being, I guess, looked after or advocated for in our legislature. Uh, there's oftentimes lobbyists that are in the legislature that fight, you know, meet fight for large companies, large large interested interests. And there are, you know, quite a few small businesses in our, in my area and people work and want to create small businesses. And I think that that's one area that I would like to um, definitely learn more about and work towards helping small businesses because that it is a different and unique um, type of, of company. And they also tend to be people, you know, living in a community and then running a business. So that's something that I think when I hear from people are, Look out for small businesses. Don't forget about small business owners. It isn't all just large, you know, energy companies or insurance companies and things like that. So that's one thing. Um, but as far as labor goes, I, you know, people are working a lot of jobs. Um, they're working really hard. Um, I, I, I think that the economy um, is doing well for some people. Um, I think the economy is not doing well for many others. I do live in an area, the district that I live in, um, people tend to, it's more of a suburban area. So um, there is, there is, there are people who are working in downtown Cincinnati for large companies. There are people, you know, like I said, working as teachers in the schools. Um, there's teach people who have small businesses. And as a, as a legislator, I will definitely be pro-labor. I'll be, you know, fighting right to work and doing whatever I can to help uh, make sure that people get fair wages and um, taking care of them in, in, the, in the hard work that they that they do and also fight for the teachers as well. But I don't know if you know that, but that's a big issue right now in Ohio with ed choice um, and teachers. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? I, I have been hearing a little bit about it, but, but I think it's such an important issue that, that it would be good for people to understand a little better what is happening in Ohio with education. Sure. So our education funding um, in Ohio right now, we have something called EdChoice that has recently um, expanded the number of schools that are considered underperforming. And so therefore, the public school in that district would need to pay for the private school voucher for a student who would choose to go to that school. So it, it is it is really um, a hot issue right now in Ohio. Um, it's very, it really just took effect and it's about to take effect in February if something doesn't change. It was an item that was added into our uh, governor's budget last year and now it's taking effect. And what it's, what it's doing is um, there are many, there are actually many schools in this district that were impacted. Schools that are, that are very, very high performing schools have a new designated school that's considered underperforming. And oftentimes it's because of um, a report card that most teachers in schools um, do not feel is, is accurate reflection of how well the school is doing. So there could be some areas actually that are exceptionally well-funded schools that would potentially have to pay for someone to take a private school voucher to go there. Those Those vouchers were actually intended to um, pay for people living in poverty who wanted to have choice to be able to go to a school. But what it's causing is even for people who are extremely, you know, well off to be able to take a voucher and go to a private school. So it's a big issue. I think that it's um, it's something that I know that our Ohio, I know that our teachers unions are fighting and also superintendents around the area 
are absolutely fighting against that as well. Um, but really, to me, what it what it does is it tells teachers, it makes teachers feel like they're not doing a good job, and they are doing a good job. Public public education is extremely important, obviously, and teachers are working really hard, and clearly they're not underperforming in so many of these schools that have been listed, but yet they're being told that they might have to you know, lose their funding for private schools. It could impact them a lot. Right now, you know, it's sort of up in the air, but right now the law says that um, there would be a there would be several schools in District 27 that would be impacted. So tell me a little bit about what uh, what your plans are. You're running, I believe, unopposed in the primary, uh, so you can really be focused uh, starting now on the general election. What what sorts of things are you planning to to do to really get to as many voters as possible and to make sure that the vote gets out? Yeah. Well, the big thing that I will do in my campaign is I will knock on a lot of doors. That's the most important way to reach voters um, is to actually have a face-to-face conversation with them. Um, it helps them to get to know you and to understand why you're running. And I did that a lot, you know, when I ran for office before. So I have a pretty good feel for um, how to do it. <laughs> I feel pretty comfortable doing it. Um, but that will be one of the biggest, um, and I, I believe that will be where I win the, the race. If I can knock on a lot of doors, meet a lot of voters, um, and we have a very specific group of people that we'd like to meet. And if we can meet with them, I think that we have an excellent chance of winning. Um, the other thing that we have to do, obviously, is we have to raise a, a significant uh, amount of funds to run this seat. My opponent raised probably $70,000 himself in the last election, but then he was given an additional 300000 from different types of organizations and groups. So as a Democrat, we don't have that. Um, we raise money. We do have some endorsements and we do um, get money from different organizations like labor, different types of labor organizations often. But for the most part, all of our money is through individual donors. And that's what I'll spend a lot of my time doing, raising that money for that. And through those, through fundraising, um, we will reach out to voters through direct mail, through digital mail. And if we can, we will um, do some type of TV ad, depending on if we feel like it would be effective. But nowadays, a lot of uh, reaching out is through digital ads and social media and that kind of kind of advertising. So as a, a very healthy dose of reaching out or doing outreach, you know, through through mailers and digital, but a very, very equally, if not more so healthy dose of meeting with voters one on one and talking with them. I seem to recall that in Ohio, there's some sort of bizarre campaign finance rules where like a kid can supposedly donate money. <laughs> so an adult can actually donate in their, their kid's name of a lot of money. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, well, actually, that's a good question. I, do, I, I don't know about that one. I've never, I've never had any kids that donate to me that I know of, though. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> So if we have listeners uh, in or near Cincinnati or more widespread, uh, what are some ways they can help you? Ways that you can help me is you can go onto my website, which is uh, sarahbitter.com. So there's no H, it's just S-A-R-A. And my last name is B as a boy, I-T-T-E-R.com. And one way you can definitely help me is you can donate to my campaign because then I will be able to spend more time knocking on doors and less time doing phone calls to raise money. Um, the other way that if you're local and you could help me is you can sign up to volunteer from my website. We have all kinds of ways to get involved. Uh, we do a very, I'll just say, I don't like to use the word aggressive. We have a very strong uh, <laughs> postcard writing program that we do. Uh, we, we like to reach out to voters via postcard. We also like to host house parties. Um, that's a really effective way to get to talk to more voters. If someone volunteered, they could, you know, just join us for parades and different types of events, um, bumper stickers. We're, it's a very grassroots, very person to person type of campaign. And we have all kinds of people in our campaign. We've had little kids all the way up to our, our, our oldest uh, volunteer that knocks on doors with me, who is um, an incredible canvasser, um, is 85 years old. So um, we we are a very family friendly campaign, and we're we're actually most most of us are women, not all of us, but many of us are women, and we you know we have a really um, I think a very approachable and positive campaign. So we would love to have more people get involved with us. 
Excellent. We will put links up on our website so people can find that information. Is there anything else that you would like to make sure that we talk about today? Yeah, there's one other thing I do want to let you know. One of the things that's a, that's a really big issue um, in Ohio and all over the United States right now is, and it's not something that people talk about very much, but the suicide rates are extremely high um, in, in Ohio. Um, Ohio now has the leading cause of death for children ages 10 to 14 is suicide. And this is a, a really massive concern. Um, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, that aren't being discussed, and and we and I think we need to do more of that. But one of the things that I did when I ran for state senate was I introduced a bill with another um, woman um, who her name is Nancy Miller, and she actually is the executive director of an organization here in Cincinnati that works on mental health in schools. And we introduced a bill to include mental health into health education in Ohio schools. Um, and the reason that we did that was because we are learning, our, ch- our children are learning about their physical health. They're learning about their bodies and how to keep themselves healthy and, you know, just different aspects of their, of their, of their health. But mental health, believe it or not, is not included in health education. Um, there's only a few states in the U.S. that actually have that. Virginia and New York are two that recently did that. And we would like to see Ohio do this because we believe that if we start to teach children about their own bodies and their own mental health and well-being, to teach them resiliency and things like, hey, when we go outside and run and play at the at recess, it helps us feel better, right? Or if we're feeling sad, you know, talking about feelings and things like that, it, it has a it has a lot of impact that we can really make to reduce those levels. And we and we really believe that there's really good evidence evidence based programming that we could be having to reduce those rates. So that's one thing that I um, you know I'm working to reintroduce again in this legislature. And ironically, um, there are two legislators that are jointly sponsoring my bill and we're working on getting more sponsors. And one of them is my opponent. (laughs) So I am not going to stop talking about mental health and mental illness. I'm not going to stop talking about disability. It really impacts people. And if we do better for people who have disabilities, we're doing better for everyone. Everyone needs this. And um, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm here. And I'm going to keep trying to come up with ways to help you know, better, make better policy in our state um, if I'm elected in the legislature in Ohio. Excellent. Sarah, thank you so much uh, for talking to me today. And thank you so much for running for office. I know that it's just a a ton of work to do on top of everything else that you do, but we're so grateful for people like you who are stepping up and running. Well, thank you very much, too. Thank you for highlighting and telling our stories and letting us have a chance to to speak about it. So I appreciate you having me on today. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at twobroadstalkingpolitics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.